Well, it's, it's always good to follow Dan, right? Um, so uh, it's a, <clears throat> I realize it's a bit intimidating here. This is supposed to be the basics of cover, cover crops, right? And you have, you have people who have been doing cover crops in this room. For how long have you been doing the cover crops now? Close to 20 years now. 20 years? And so you guys get a really nice perspective here because so you've t got the 20-year experience. And like myself and my grandfather, we've been doing this for two um, which is which is going to be kind of a unique deal. So I'm going to pull in some um, I'm going to pull in some other things. The nice thing is, as you were talking, Dan, I'm sitting there nodding along. You really laid the basis for me to be able to open this up into a really good conversation, which is which is um, I think what we're open for. First of all, I need to tell you a little bit about who we are, uh, who I am, who we are. Um, this is my family. <laughs> um, <coughs> you look behind there. There's a bit of a planting issue with our with our cover crop behind there. But you see, I've got a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old and a one-year-old. That's my wife on the right-hand side. Um, <coughs> man. Um, so we are so we're trying to do this together as a family. And so what we're trying to do is invest in not just, not just my current economic you know, profit, but also I'm trying to invest in a situation so I can leave my kids with something valuable. Um, that's, my, that's my number one goal. It, it drives me every day. Um, we also like to take things that are broken and turn them into fun. So you notice my three-year-old, her name is Ella. We call her Hurricane Ella because she destroys everything that she gets into. Um, we had a bit of a drainage problem here, but before we fixed it this fall when it got dry, we used it as a nice mud hole to play in. Um, and she also gets to come out and help me on the farm. Like that's, that's a lot of my life. But the other part of my story that's important um, is this was our Halloween picture a couple years ago. And you see there in the middle, um, you see my grandfather. And we have a really unique situation on my farm. I'm a 34-year-old retired high school English teacher. Um, my grandfather is an 89-year-old crusty farmer who's been conventionally t who has conventionally tilled everything for 60 years. We have no fence rows. We have no trees. We have a lot of obstacles to this soil health thing. And so a big part of my story is the overcoming the barriers to get him to um, invest in soil health. To, to use cover crops, and it's been, a, it's been a fun thing. So when Rob Myers asked me to talk about this, a lot of the way that I thought about of this presentation is what are the barriers that we come, that, that we come into with planting and terminating? These are all the questions that my grandfather asked me. Um, and so that's what we're gonna get into. How did, how did, my gran how did I convince my grandfather um, and overcome these practical issues that we should, that we should try some of these cover crops? Um, but before we do that, you guys have been sitting for a while. I told you I'm a retired high school English teacher. Um, we do this a lot. So um, we're going to take a little bit of time to get up. And we're going to all pretend like you have somebody that, you're go that you need to convince to do cover crops for the first time. Maybe it's you. Maybe you have a problem that you need to figure out. Um, maybe um, it's your neighbor who, who is across the road. So the question that I'd like for you guys to ask, I'm going to ask you to do something kind of strange, is to get up and talk to somebody that you're not with. Okay, so it wouldn't be fair for me to go talk with Dan because we're here. Okay, um, so, but what, I, what I'll do, oh yeah, nah, that works out fine. Um, but so I'm gonna put a timer up, and the question is what's, like, what are some of the barriers that you see or that you hear about um, that, that are your issues? Now remember, this is a basic cover crop track thing as well. So, um, so I'm gonna give you a three minute timer here in a second. I thought I was. Well, no I'm not, because my flash thing isn't working. I've, here, I'll, I'll use my watch here, which I do in my classroom. Um, so I'm going to give you guys about three minutes to get up and find somebody else and talk about Then I'm actually just going to take questions and we're going to go back and forth in that way. Is that fair enough? Yep. All right, sounds good. So three minutes. Um, ready, go. <laughs>
Okay, we've got about 30 seconds left. About 30 seconds. Alright, if you'll kind of meander back to your seats, finish up your conversations, please. Alright, if you'll kind of finish up a little bit, try to head back to your seats, please. It happens every time. It happens every time. I do this at churches sometimes. Oh, I know. That's, that's what's good about it. All right, if you guys could please uh, head back to your seats. That would be good. It's, the troublemakers are in the back, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. They'll, yeah. All right, so uh, I'm gonna just briefly, uh, I hate to interrupt good conversation because you're probably learning more out there um, than you have in your entire conference. One of my favorite, I went to no-till on the plains one time in the, middle, in the middle of Kansas, and I walked away with some of the most practical things when I was skipping conferences, when I was skipping speakers and I was out in the hallway talking to other people. So I hope that was fruitful. I'm gonna ask for some stuff. I'm just briefly gonna tell you what we do because honestly, it's about what Dan does. Um, so when we grow soybeans, um, like these are like, you know, an almost finished product soybean that's planted into cereal rye, much like, you know, it's rolled and crimped cereal rye. That's our kind of our end result. They look really nice. The neighbors like the way they look. Um, when we plant them, we plant green. You notice that we, we are small farmers intentionally. I farm with my grandfather. He's 89 and he still drives the combine for everything that we do, which means that we are limited in the ability to pick up. We've had the chance to do that. Um, to pick up a lot of ground and we've just kind of stubbornly refused to do that. So we plant our soybeans green. Um, we tried to terminate in front of our tractor because we have small planters. Um, we found that we have hills and terraces and we can't go around them very well with that. So then um, what we do now is um, I, we, we flip the roller on the back and we actually spray as we do that. We spray a half rate of Roundup as we go through and do that. Um, and then we're trying this year not coming back, so we're, we upped our rate to about 100 pounds of rye. Um, so, and so that's, that's essentially then what we're gonna come back at, um, you know, right before canopy and use a Roundup or a Liberty, depending upon the beans that we use. Um, for our corn, this is our corn this last year. Um, pretty much everybody in our area was about right around 200 bushels this year. Um, this corn was, uh, was a field average of 240. Um, which was uh, which was nice. It was especially because we did that on 140 pounds of applied nitrogen, and we're only two years into cover crops, which is nice. Um, so how we did that? Um, a cocktail, much like like I said, I'm going to speed through this because Dan talked about this, right? Um, this is a big cocktail after our wheat crop, um, and like I'll show you some numbers on that in a little bit. This is what it looks like now, and eventually by you know by the spring, there's going to be some green growing back in there. There's some there's wheat that we left intentionally. Um, and so that's what we're going to plant into that. Um, we plant corn into that. We do complete zero till. Um, we actually took our row cleaners off. We might put them back on this next year, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so we plant right into that. Um, you see that emerging up the row. Um, and we'll talk about some of those other pictures later. Um, but before we get into some of the problems, some of the barriers that I've seen and talked about, I'm curious, what did you guys talk about? What are some of the things that came up in your conversations? Okay, social and psychological barriers. Can't imagine. Like, like what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, the first time you're planting in three foot tall ride along a highway. <laughs> Six, all right, yeah. Like, and there is, and, and for my grandfather, for example, who is known to have the cleanest fields in the county, um, 
his barrier, his, his uh, psychological barrier was the neighbor. Like, what's the neighbor gonna think? How is the, you know, it's not gonna be this clean looking feel, right? So like, that's a very real barrier. So what do we do to overcome that? Drive on. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> that's, yeah, right. Stay out, stay out of the coffee shop, all those things. But like, that's a really hard thing, especially when you're, because like, we're all the early adapters here, right? Like, we're, I'm, I'm the person, I don't care what my neighbor thinks because he thinks I'm crazy already. Um, but, what, but what about the people who aren't the early adapters? Um, like, what do we do to overcome that, that psychological barrier? Any, any ideas on that? I used to think it was just economics. I could talk economics to people. But it's, I guess that's a tough problem. Like it really is. They can see all the success that I want. And that's a really real barrier. So I don't know that I've heard a really good answer for that. They'll remind you of your failures too if they see them. No way. <laughs> it's a good, that is a good point, yeah. So, all right, other, like other barriers that we see. Thank you for that, thank you. Other barriers that you guys talked about. Okay, lack of information. Right, and often by yourself. Right, yeah. So how does so how does that then keep someone from implementing a new practice? Because you can find it. I can go on Google and find all the information ever I want. You know, I want to. But that but that is a very real barrier to say what. Yeah, that, that's probably true. Okay. Some have, some have, but they're not toxic. Uh, you're smelling rolling down uh, cereal rye or soybeans, which is a failure, right? I mean, there's, you can't document that that's going to work. Well, it is failure. It's failure. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying is there's, but there's a reason for that. And so, and you haven't found that. Did you figure out why it failed? Yeah. So it's easier, the answer to agriculture right now, the easy thing to do is to till it. The more complicated thing to do is to no-till it and cover crops. So it goes back to the mindset. What is it that you want to accomplish? And what is it that we're going to need to do in the future? We need to be, we need to be protecting our soil, but we don't understand that. Yeah. The speaker that we had before this did a very good job of yeah, and like as, as you were talking, my thought was initially that we should become better at sharing information. Um, like, so I had a fascinating conversation with my neighbor across the road, and they're, they, you know, they, they see my beans, um, and they see, they see the cover crops that I'm, that I'm using and the way that I'm growing soybeans, but they didn't realize I didn't use a residual on my field. Like, so they, they just thought I was spraying whatever. Like, and so, like, we're not good at sharing that. I'm not going to go put a billboard on my thing that's, you know, by, by my farm that says, I use $10 in chemicals on this acre, you know. Um, so, so, but then we have people like um, Dan and I's friend Will. Like, Will started something called the Idea, like the Idea Network. And what he's doing is, like, everything that they're doing, they're sharing and they're bringing that out. I think that's a really important part of, like, that, that's an important part of what we, like, what we do here, but also what we need to get better at as farmers. So, yeah, thank you. Other barriers that we see. This is not the one we talked about, but uh, one of them. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting over. I'm trying to convince my tenant to adopt some of these things we're talking about. Hmm. He goes to his fertilizer and chemical supplier and gets the other side. He goes to a machinery dealer that wants to sell him a four-wheel drive tractor. Uh, you know, 
it's like the tent is in the middle. Yeah. And, and has lost much of the expertise in fertilizer and chemicals and the, like to, to be able to make informed decisions about some of those too, maybe. So, yeah. Another, real Another point that's been brought up, I got a friend of mine that is just conventional farmer and he said, I, I'm getting tired of the no-tillers and the cover croppers telling me that I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> year after year after year, I can, I can look at my yield charts and I see that I have been successful throughout the whole thing. And that's, that was his complaint. But it, yeah, but his metric is wrong. What, uh, what's his soil doing compared well, to Well, I, and that's, I approached that with him. But, and some guys you just, you know, you start a conversation and you walk away real quick because it's just not going to go anywhere. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. In our area, we're kind of 36 miles east of St. Louis. We're really down on because we strip till, we split and roll, and then we raise cover crop. If you don't turn to the soil black in our area, they're out in that $300 Interesting. Anything else that surfaced in these conversations? Um, I'm going to briefly talk about my grandfather because he's kind of a he's kind of a, a, an anomaly maybe in some way. So my grandfather's first thing is if you're going to use some cover crops, man, the soil's not going to dry out, right? Um, and so he's he's like we're going we're going to till this. You know, we, we use our field cultivator really well, and we're going we're going to till this so it'll dry out so we can plant earlier, right? Um, and one of the things that I had to really sell, sell him in, on was this idea of translocation. Like this is, a, this is our neighbor's field that's been tilled recently um, and you're going to see a different picture. Um, and like all that water is going to leave through evaporation, right? Uh, you know, some of that through infiltration, but a lot of it's going to like leave through evaporation. So like, so my cereal rye crop on that exact same day was like we had just finished up planting this field, this picture I showed you earlier. And so like, that's, that, I was like, Grandpa, we can suck this moisture out. We can then make this drier and uh, we can make this drier more quickly and actually benefit from that moisture. And for him, that was a very compelling argument. He was worried because um, he tried no-till in 1982 or something like that. It got a, we had a really wet spring. His soybean crop failed. Um, and so he's like, never again am I going to do any kind of a no-till situation. And for him, like this answered one of his big fears. It was the fear of not getting a crop in the ground. I think like, that's a part of what we're talking about, our barriers. What are these fears, these things that are keeping us from trying something, um, something different? Um, another thing that he said is that you won't be able to plant into this thick mat. You know, this is what Dan was talking about, you know. Um, and so the, the answer that, that I found on Google um, was like just literally zero till. Like we had to, we had to replace some double disc openers, but we literally stru stripped everything off. It kept it from wrapping. Um, and so like we, we just tried to go as lean as we possibly can. Um, and so like that was just a really easy answer for that easy barrier that he had. Um, the, the other thing that we talked about, he was really worried that, that these soybeans and the corn eventually wasn't going to come through the mat. And so the answer for that that we found was just, it was a depth in population. Um, if, we, if we can go through and we can plant, you know, like we can move our notch down just a little bit deeper so that we're planting um, a soybean where it should be set for like instead of an inch and a half, we're planting it at one point, you know, one, one, an inch and three quarters. That really helps. And we up the population just a little bit from 140 to 165. Um, and, and again, like that was something that has worked out very well for us in terms of growing a good um, soybean crop. My favorite um, is my grandpa is, is you know, this, that crusty 89-year-old farmer, right? He's like, you're just going to waste money by putting plants in the ground. And so I started thinking about, like, what we try to do is we try to replace chemistry with biology wherever we possibly can. So, you know, in our, our soybeans, we're using, the, we're using the cereal rye, biology, that goes into that um, to replace a lot of our residual herbicides. And it's actually save us, saving us a lot of money. Like, here's a picture of our soybeans that I showed you earlier. You know, they're clean. They're as clean as our neighbors. There's like, we don't, we don't have water hemp. We don't have mare's tail. <laughs> they're clean. And that's kind of a picture underneath, like the, the, the residual mat that we have underneath there. 
Um, and then here's our financials for those soybeans. Um, a typical du double residual pass that, that's used in our area um, or chemical program looks about like this. People are going to go in the fall. Um, they're going to they're going to spray their basis concoction. They're going to burn down with Roundup 240 and Authority Max, or like that was, that's the Monsanto version. There's other versions, um, and then um, they're going to come back with a post like a Roundup and a, and a double residual warrant. The the total bill for that is eighty one dollars and fifty cents. So like that was that was from my that was from my neighbor's financials this last year. Um, so our our soybeans we ended up with twenty three dollars including application. Um, from a like from a that was our full roundup rate and so we're saving before we start anything we're saving close to sixty dollars which is real money when you're talking about small um, small economics um, we, we ended up going through and doing the cost of production um, so we're, we're talking five dollars and fifty cent uh, per bushel soybeans and four dollars and forty eight cent uh, cents per bushel um, of our green soybeans um, so then we're talking profits per acre right and so then um, our profit per acre on no-till soybeans was $244 versus $322. Again, that's $80 per acre more um, just from the, and like that's real money that people are really concerned about. Um, so also, we, um, we're starting to use the Haney soil test. This is, this is a test that we pulled off after that big cocktail mix you saw. So before our corn this year, we had 126 pounds of nitrogen available to our crop this last year. Um, you know, we had 58 of phosphorus and 72 of potassium. Um, and that's how we were able to turn around and grow 240 bushel corn on 140 pounds of, of nitrogen. And again, we're two years in. This isn't something that, I'm not, I'm not like Dan, I don't have these soils that have been done forever. Like our soil's still in our waterways because it all ran off. Um, so the, the other, my other favorite one, my grandpa was really worried about voles. Anybody have vole problems? Good, I'm glad somebody else does. Um, and he was really like deathly afraid of these little mice. Um, and so we talked to everybody. We actually had a patch this last year that we didn't roll because we, we roll and crimp everything. We had a patch that we didn't roll and they ate 15 acres of corn, like, of corn and soy. Just, the whole thing just decimated. <laughs> Got, uh, Doug Peterson from the NRCS, NRCS came out um, in my area and he said he's never seen anything like that. Um, he's like, this is the worst I've ever seen. And so his answer, um, and the answer that we've seen play out on our farm, was that we just, we roll. And it takes, out the, it takes out the habitat, it takes out their cover on top, it makes it flat, and it makes, basically makes them flee the field. Um, and it's been very effective for us. We haven't had any vole problems. I mean, there's a couple patches here and there, but like, that's a, a, another really real thing. So, like anything else, because you have a guy here, Dan DeSutter, who's been doing this for 20 years, um, and so, like, are, are there any other barriers or things that you guys are worried about or people you know are worried about when it talks about planting, terminating, like getting into cover crops?